Today on the church calendar is the commemoration of Archbishop of Canterbury, William Laud. He was born in 1573 in Reading, England, in the county of Berkshire. I've never had the pleasure of going there, but I found this beautiful painting uh, by the Reverend, let's see, I have the name here, Thomas James Judkin, which he painted perhaps 100 or 150 years or so after William Laud. And it's the outside of the Abbey in Reading. And you can see along the outside wall where various notices have been glued up against uh, the brick wall. I can only wonder if some of those postings included uh, religious uh, interpretations or, or uh, biblical challenges to some of the teachings of the church at that time. Uh, William Laud was archbishop during a very tumultuous time in the church. There's been many tumultuous times in the church, including in the Church of England. In fact, his time was so tumultuous that he was uh, imprisoned as the Archbishop of Canterbury for about five years, at the end of which he was executed. So this was a time when people uh, took their religious convictions pretty seriously, but also often religious matters were tied up with political matters because in the Church of England, the crown was also the head of state. But William Laud is an important individual and he is commemorated in our calendar on January the 10th each year, which is the day that he in fact was executed. He was a clergyman in the Church of England. He served as a parish priest he was a professor at Oxford for a period of time, became a bishop, and then the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the English church. He was appointed to that position by King Charles I in 1633 and served officially in that capacity for 12 years. But as I said, for the last five of those years, or almost half, he was actually in prison. He was a key advocate of the church reforms that were being put forward by King Charles I. And because of that, he battled long and hard against the Puritan faction within the church. Now, the Church of England is an interesting family, um, and it is a family in the true sense of the word. Uh, families have nice people and families have mean people and families have uh, wonderful people who are great leaders and inspirers and families have crazy ants that live in the attic and the Church of England is no different. And at the time of the Reformation uh, and since the time of the Reformation, you could say, there's always been this push and this pull within Anglicanism with some at one end of the spectrum, on one end of the spectrum, uh, believing, always believing that the Church of England was not reformed enough and should uh, shed uh, any signs of its former Catholic self. And then on the other end of the spectrum, those who have the conviction that the Church of England is simply meant to be restored back to what the Catholic Church in England looked like uh, prior to the supremacy of the Pope. Uh, the, the Reformation in England was a bit different than on the continent, because whereas in the, on the continent, and uh, forgive me if I forget who came up with this uh, analogy, uh, but whereas on the continent, the reformers dug up the garden and replaced it, in England, the reformers weeded the garden and reformed it. That is, they sought to keep certain aspects of the universal church that had been in England long before the Reformation. The church of England did not begin with Henry VIII. There had been a church there since the 
5th, 6th, 7th centuries, perhaps even earlier, the Council of Whitby being described in the 300s, the early 300s. So the church, the universal church, the Catholic church, not the Roman Catholic church, the Catholic church has been in England for a very long time. And so how do we reform the church? Do we bring it back to its uh, pre-papal uh, days? Or do we go with this new reformation uh, as advocated by Luther and Calvin and so on? So there's always been this push and pull and tension within, within the Church of England. And the Puritans, especially the more radical Puritans, were those that would like to see uh, John Calvin's uh, theology run prominent, who would prefer to see a more Presbyterian form of church government rather than a government by elder uh, by bishops rather and would like to see a more simplified ceremonial and would probably uh, put scripture as being more important than the sacraments as opposed to perhaps putting them side by side in their value and importance now that's obviously there's i'm i'm we're painting with brush strokes broad brush strokes here which is always dangerous because you're always going to misdescribe someone's position. But in any case, William Laud really um, wanted to, uh, uh, first of all, o overturn the preeminence of John Calvin's version of predestination. Uh, William Laud was a believer in, f in the free will of human beings. He believed that salvation was a possibility for all people. Uh, that is, God has not predestined certain individuals to be redeemed, passing others over, but rather every person has the opportunity to say yes or no to the gospel upon hearing the gospel. He also was a strong advocate of maintaining episcopacy, government by bishops, seeing this as an office of apostolic succession that the bishops had been ordained by bishops had been ordained by bishops in a successive line back to the apostles and christ himself and he also wanted to see beauty and dignity in the worship and so in some sense became a forerunner of what came to be known as the high church movement within Anglicanism. William Laud is known for his beautiful prayer, which is in our prayer books. It's a prayer for the church, a prayer for the universal church, and I'd like to pray it now. Gracious Father, we humbly pray for your holy universal church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth, with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purge it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where it is superstitious, rectify it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen and confirm it. Where it is in want, furnish it. Where it is divided and rent asunder, make up the breaches of it, O Holy One of Israel. And so I've finish with this prayer that we pray on this commemoration of William Laud. Keep us, O Lord, constant in faith and zealous in witness, that like your servant William Laud, we may live in your fear, die in your favor, and rest in your peace. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.